Good afternoon. Good morning. You're on the West Coast. This is John Harrison. I'm the executive director of ADISA, the Alternative and Direct Investment Securities Association. And I'm here with our partners of Real Assets Advisor Magazine to bring you a webinar on opportunity zones. We've got a great lineup for you today. And speaking of opportunity zones, the next opportunity you have will be at the ADISA meeting, which is April 4th through 6th in Orlando of this year. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our partner, Brooke Huffington with Real Assets Advisor. Brooke? Thank you, John. Yes, my name is Brooke Huffington, Managing Director of Real Assets Advisor, a publication of Institutional Real Estate, Inc. And yes, we thank you for joining our co-sponsored Real Assets Advisor and ADISA monthly webinar. Please stay tuned for next month's upcoming webinar, Infrastructure, how this alternative fits into changing markets. Participants will be Real Assets Advisor Editor, Mike Console, CIM Group, BlackRock, and Capital Innovations. For today's webinar, we will begin the Q&A at a quarter till the hour. Please use the Q&A feature located on your Zoom screen. All materials featured and presented in today's webinar will be available within 12 to 24 hours at realassetsadvisor.com and adisa.org. For today's webinar, Opportunity Zones, Current Trends and Best Practices, our moderator will be McLaw PC Zone, Alan Lincoln. Participants are Griffin Capitals, Kevin Shields, and Urban Catalyst, Sean Raft. Alan, let's begin. Okay, hey, great. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, quick introductions here, just for uh, kind of continue on that theme. So I'm Alan Lincoln. I work for I'm a senior financial analyst for Mick Law. I've uh, been with Mick since about 2007. We're an alternative investments due diligence firm uh, specializing in REITs, funds, DSTs, uh, conservation easements, opportunity zones, as well as energy, oil and gas, and drilling programs. Uh, look at about 200 different alternative investment programs a year. Um, I mainly conduct financial due diligence on those uh, on those programs, uh, including preparing our own financial models uh, to see how those funds uh, or how those programs are going to perform. Um, Kevin, you want to give us a quick introduction as well? Yeah, and I'm I'm Kevin Shields. I'm the chairman and CEO of Griffin Capital. Griffin Capital we founded in 1995. We've got about uh, now about 180 employees and. Uh, about 15 billion of assets under management. We managed two public non-traded real estate investment trusts. We've done a series of Delaware statutory trust transactions. We've raised a couple of qualified opportunities of funds. We've raised about a billion one of equity to support the ground up development of 21 assets around the country in 15 cities representing about 2.2, 2.3 billion of uh, multifamily, ground up multifamily community development. Okay, great, Sean. Yeah, hi, Sean Raft. I am the uh, Chief Administrative Officer General Counsel for Urban Catalyst. Urban Catalyst is a uh, multi-asset opportunity zone fund located in Silicon Valley fund sponsor. Prior to that, I was a trial attorney for the better part of 10 years and then portfolio manager for a family office here in Silicon Valley uh, for another about 10 years before joining Urban. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Well, we'll just get into uh, a little bit of background here before we jump into some, some questions and visit with our panelists a little bit. So uh, for starters, just kind of background on the Opportunity Zone Fund, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, of December of 2017 added Section 1400Z to the tax code. It was a program that was uh, provided, a program that was intended to provide incentive for private long-term investment uh, in low-income communities and contiguous tracts. Uh, that were designated as qualified opportunity zones. The states designated those tracks. They were designated by uh, many times by the governor's office, and then they were certified by the United States Treasury as qualified opportunity zones. Uh, there was three basic benefits. We'll talk about those in detail here in just a few seconds, but there was three basic benefits for the taxpayers that were investing in those qualified opportunity funds. It was a deferral of capital gains tax uh, that would have been payable upon the sale through December 31st of 2026. Uh, there was a step up of basis of 10% or 15%. Those benefits have now expired, but we'll talk about why that's relevant in just a few seconds. Uh, and then lastly, the no tax, not last but not pro probably the greatest benefit of all was the no tax on the appreciation of the asset itself uh, if it was held for at least 10 years. 
in order to receive those benefits for the qualified opportunity funds, the, the, the individual investors had to roll over capital gains from the sale of a property uh, into a qualified opportunity fund. They had to do that within 180 days of the sale. They also had to make a timely election of that uh, qualified opportunity fund under section 1400C. Uh, with respect to the requirements for the Qualified Opportunity Fund itself, it had to meet a 90% asset test. And that was at least 90% of its assets of the Qualified Opportunity Fund assets uh, needed to be held in Qualified Opportunity Zone property. Uh, it also had to self-certify. Uh, there was a change to that 90% asset test to provide for working capital, which we'll talk about in just a few moments as well. That 90% asset test had to be met two times a year. Uh, one on the last day of the first six months of the tax period, and then also on the last day of the Qualified Opportunity Funds tax year. A couple of additional requirements. Uh, the gain had to be from the sale of an unrated third party. It had to be an arm's length unrated third party transaction. It could not be a um, you know, parent subsidiary organization or something like that, a transfer between entities. It had to be unrelated third party. Uh, and those funds themselves were the proceeds that had to be invested uh, in, in the Qualified Opportunity Fund, which then had to take those proceeds and invest in Qualified Opportunity Fund <clears throat> properties. Um, just a little bit more in detail about the benefits themselves. So we talked about the, the recognizing the income from this from the sale. Uh, that income did not have to be recognized in that tax uh, that taxable gain or that the, tr the triggering moment was not until December 31st, 2026. That was when investors would be required to pay uh, the tax on that capital gain. So they could defer the tax all the way until that point. Uh, the stepped up basis rule, uh, that was 10% if the asset was held for at least five years, which would have expired December 31st, 2021. Uh, and then there was a stepped up basis for an additional 5%, which is also now expired. That would have been if the asset was held for seven years. Uh, again, these are both prior to December 31st, 2026. So that would, date would have been December 31st, 2019. Uh, and then last but not least, the investors uh, were not to pay tax on the appreciation of the asset if it was held in that qualified opportunity fund uh, for at least 10 years. Um, there is legislation that was introduced in early 2021, which would have triggered a, 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 an extension date of all of these dates. It would have moved all of these dates, uh, slid them to the right by an additional two years. So through December 31st, 2028, which would mean that the additional 5% or additional 10% basis step up, excuse me, uh, would not e expire until 2023, December 31st of 2023. And if you invested on or prior to December 31st, 2021, you would have gotten the additional 5% step up in basis as well. So just a change that's in the works uh, uh, may come to fruition, may not. Uh, there's some speculation or quite a bit of speculation about whether it will or will not. I'll let our panelists talk about that in just a few moments here. A couple of OZ fund changes uh, that I wanted to mention that have taken place when the original tax code was uh, was put out, there was a lot of questions. And in fact, there was probably more questions than there was answered from the original tax code. Uh, and so there's been clarifications as we've gone along the way, um, and then some modifications or changes uh, to the tax code as well. Uh, the substantial improvement requirement, which said that an asset uh, had to be uh, substantially improved. So if you buy a million dollar piece of dirt, uh, you got to turn around and build uh, more than a million dollars worth of benefit on top of that piece of dirt. So that was the substantial improvement requirement. Uh, that was modified to disregard the period uh, due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, it was modified to exclude the period between April 2020 and March 31st of 2021. Uh, working capital was a big deal. Uh, lots of folks talked about, well, how am I supposed to build up this equity in this fund and then go invest in these properties if I don't have the ability to hold this working capital? So uh, there was the working capital safe harbor uh, provision that allowed the QOZs uh, to hold working capital if they were if they had a written plan to deploy the capital and intended to follow it. Uh, that had to be done within a 30 month period. Um, there was additional regulations that allowed an extension of that if there was a federally declared disaster area um, that would have uh, made it un unreasonable, unfeasible to uh, put that capital out within the 30 month period. Uh, the 90% asset test, this was also a change to the coronavirus pandemic that would have uh, allowed QOFs to satisfy that 90% asset test. Um, if, the, if the date in which there, I talked about the two dates a year they have to certify would have been the last date of the first six months and then the last day of the tax year, uh, they can disregard that 90% asset test if it fell between April 1st, 2021 and June 30, 2021, which are slightly different than the substantial improvement requirement dates up above. Um, there's also the 12 month reinvestment rule. There was a lot of questions about whether, okay, if I invest in one qualified opportunity zone, can I jump out of that qualified opportunity zone and invest in a different QOF? Uh, this allowed, uh, excuse me, qualified opportunity zone. This allowed the qualified opportunity funds 
12 months to reinvest proceeds from a sale. So if they took uh, an asset substantially improved but, but wanted to continue investing in QOZs, uh, they could do that within a 12 month window uh, without impacting their 90% asset test. Another clarification was the qualified improvement property. Uh, this, this went to the bonus depreciation, again, which our, our panelists can talk about here in just a few minutes, but the, what, what people call the bonus depreciation uh, aspect of this, this corrected that depreciable life of that improvement property from 39 years back to 15 years, so allowed a much greater, uh, or maybe not bonus, or, but just accelerated depreciation cycle. Uh, and then lastly, the QO fund penalty relief, uh, that was to prevent uh, an imposition of, of penalties uh, if, again, that 90% asset test was failed to have been met between April 2020 and June 30, 2021. Okay, enough background here. Let's kind of get into some questions. Uh, Sean, you're up first on deck. One of the questions I hear most often is, are opportunity zones working? Are there people investing in them? Uh, and can you talk us through some details of, of what it looks like? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Alan. I, I think uh, the answer to that, the short answer is yes, they are working. And the more people that are becoming aware of it and all of its benefits, I think are starting to understand how to take advantage of that with their CPAs and everything else. But rather than to take my word for it, I think the best uh, you know, third party source for that information would be the GAO. The GAO has done two reports on the Opportunity Zone program, one under the Trump, uh, under the Trump administration, one under Biden administration, the latest one I'll be talking about is the October 21 uh, GAO report, October 2021. And so, you know, overall high level, the GAO reported positive results for the program as a whole. They highlighted a couple of things specifically I wanted to point out. There's a lot of impact investing concerns that particularly Democrats uh, had voiced uh, opinions about. And Biden had said he wanted reporting, increased reporting requirements and things like that. But the GAO came out and said in, in October that as a result of their study, it indicates that it, the, the, the OZ is doing what it was designed to do, at least, you know, in, in the years that they've been looking at. There's uh, the OZs that were designated had lower income levels, higher poverty levels and greater minority populations. And it breaks it down on a chart in the next slide. If you take a look. There's a little bit of detail here, but the two sections uh, that I wanted to point out was if you look at the median household income in, in the average opportunity zone, it's, uh, you know, in some cases, a third of what the uh, median average household income might be in either the unqualified tracks, half of what it is in, the, in, in all tracks and, and, and less than the ones that were not selected. So it, it's hitting the mark there. As far as poverty and unemployment, it's the same kind of statistics that you'd be looking at and hope, hoping to see. So that's a good result. In addition to that, in terms of demographics, uh, you can take a look and see that the uh, demographic information for the particular opportunity zones by census track, uh, there's increasingly non-white populations in the zones that were designated and the numbers there on the, on the right-hand column um, indicate that. And so that was a positive, I think, for, for political purposes anyway, with respect to the opportunity zone. In addition to that, uh, the Opportunity Zone um, program and the GAO reported uh, that there were a multiplicity or a diverse uh, set of projects that were uh, targeted for development with the QOFs, and those went across a spectrum of asset classes from residential all the way to business, but other projects included agricultural development, land development, renewable energy businesses as well, but primarily GAO reported that real estate was by and large the most significant uh, investment class of any uh, qualified opportunity zone fund. Then uh, the GAO did a study of 18 uh, QOFs. They were selected at random. There's a formula that the GAO talks about in, in the selection of those particular opportunity zone funds, but at, they did a canvas of those 18 funds, asked them a bunch of questions, did some interviews, and it turns out that they all across the board reflected the things that you would want to see an opportunity zone program providing, which is uh, 12 of the 18 funds indicated they invested in locations they would have otherwise ignored, but for the Opportunity Zone program. Six of the funds indicated consistency in their business plan and objectives, regardless of uh, any changes with respect to the Opportunity Zone. One of the negatives, though, was legislative complexity may have indicated an adverse impact with respect to investment progress. In other words, more money may have been invested if the, uh, if the law wasn't so difficult to explain to investors on the front end. 
you know, my own personal opinion is that that just that's a natural course of legislation with any program. We saw that with EB5 and 1031 as well. Then um, states got involved and the, the Fed, uh, the GAO wanted to give an opinion to the Fed about what the state's view was on the tax incentive. And so they asked them a bunch of canvassing questions. And generally speaking, the, the majority, I would say, or the plurality anyway, of states that were interviewed indicated a net positive impact in their geographies as a result of the program. Uh, there was a, you know, neither a positive nor, nor negative um, net neutral impact um, was 10 of those that were interviewed. And then no impact was five. The, the, the highlight here is the net negative impact was only one. I'm not really sure which state or district that was, but one indicated a net neg negative impact as, as a result of the program, and then 20 are still undecided. The uh, COVID, we talked about COVID. Alan brought up some of the, uh, you know, the, the legislature, I should say the uh, regulatory changes that were implemented in 2020, 39 and 2021, 10 in terms of COVID, but as far as impact uh, from an investment state perspective, it turns out that probably we need more data. So some have indicated there's no change. Some indicated a, a sense of decreased investment as a result of COVID, but most of those state respondents that were interviewed indicated they just really weren't sure at all what the impact was uh, with respect to COVID. And we probably won't know for maybe a couple more years until the dust, the dust settles on that issue. And then I think the final thing that I highlighted anyway from the, the GAO report was that total investment numbers. And this is, I think this is impressive. So the number I wanna focus on uh, and it's stated here in the millions is the dollar amount invested in qualified opportunity zone uh, property. And that's uh, 29, uh, 29 billion uh, in 2019. This is as of you know, reported Q4 of 2019, but it, it should be indicated that the manner of reporting here was electronic and not paper filing. That's one thing. And the second thing is, is the 90% test, which Alan talked about, does not require funds to report uh, capital received in Q4 of 2019 because it's not part of this, it's not counted in, the, in that 90% test. So it's quite possible that that $29 billion figure is significantly underreported because it doesn't include the Q4 investment in that year in 2019. And at least in our experience, and I think it's consistent probably across, and Kevin can speak to this as well, across all the fund sponsors out there, the majority of QOF investment appears to have been in Q4 of any given tax year as it is a tax advantage fund. And that's when you know the tax planning is taking, is taking um, effect. So anyway, that was, that was a mouthful, but that's what the GAOs, I thought that would be interesting for folks to, to digest a little bit about how the GAO is reporting it to the government. Yeah, good data for sure. Thanks, Sean. Uh, let's talk about your own personal experiences. Kevin, uh, can you kind of give us a, an idea of what kind of deal flow you've seen come through these funds? Uh, you know, maybe not, not, not obviously not specific dollars, but maybe give us, a, you know, some percentages, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the first year and then what happened in 2019, what happened in 2021. Just kind of give us the rundown of your own experience. Yeah, I'm going to echo a couple of things that, that Sean said. So given the complexity of the legislation, the fact that it took so long, to get the three releases out to kind of clarify some of the amb ambiguity in the legislation, the last of which was really not delivered until March of uh, 2019. So I can tell you, we we really launched our first fund in, in effectively in June of 2019. And, and I, I would uh, echo the sentiments that, that Sean uh, indicated about the fund flows in 2019. We saw a fairly significant surge in Q4 of uh, equity raise ourselves in our first fund. Um, not necessarily because it was Q4, and that's when tax planning is uh, is really initiated in any uh, in any earnest way. But probably more as a result of the fact that as uh, as you went through the rules, December 31st, 2019 was the last date to invest to get the benefit of the full 15 basis point step up, and so that was a trigger point, and it really kind of motivated people to uh, to transact. It was a little bit more muted in 2020 as a result of. Uh, they're not being that trigger, and, and obviously we're in the middle of COVID. And then we saw another nice blip up in uh, in equity investment into qualified opportunities on funds in December of 2021, because to the point that you made, Alan, earlier, that was the last date to invest 
to get the benefit of the 10% basis step up uh, for, you know, for which you had to hold your interest in the fund for five years prior to the end of 20, 2026. We are still seeing some fairly uh, strong flows. It's a little bit more episodic as people are liquidating assets and, and taking advantage of the tax benefits associated with subchapter Z of the code. I will tell you that I, I always found it a little bit uh, curious that people were so anxious to get invested by the end of 2019 and again by the end of 2021, because whereas those basis step ups are nice and just to, just to put a bow around that, if you invested a million dollars uh, of capital gains into a qualified opportunity zone fund in December of 2019, you effectively are paying your capital gains tax after the deferral period in 2026 based on $850,000 that gain. And again, based on $900,000 that gain if you invested prior to December 2021. Uh, that being said, the overall impact on internal rate of return given the 10 year holding period to get the benefit of the 100% basis step up after 10 years is really the significant economic driver behind this legislation. And by our math, if you just look at kind of a stripped down example of investing in an asset in a QOZ as opposed to one that's not in a QOZ, the tax benefits you know, may add as much as 300, 320 basis points in overall net after-tax internal rate of return. The 5% basis step up on top of the 10 that you would have received in 19, really, had, you know, the impact is like 10 or 11 basis points and the 10% basis step up that has now passed as of 1231, uh, 2021, really only added another 19 or 20 basis points to that internal rate of return. So you can see it's a fairly small percentage relative to the total tax benefits associated with subchapter Z. And, uh, you know, I tell you, our word of caution really is it's less important to get invested in the end of 2021 than it is to make sure that you've got the right sponsor, you've underwritten the sponsor. This is a real estate transaction, first and foremost. This is not a tax transaction. So the tax benefits, albeit significant, are not going to make a bad deal, a good deal, but they can certainly make a good deal, an outstanding deal. And so as a result, as we continue to educate the market, there's still phenomenal opportunities to invest in qualified opportunity zones and up opportunity zone funds and really garner that 100% basis step up after a 10 year investment period. That is, as I said earlier, the real economic driver. So we anticipate seeing some fairly significant fund flows in 2022 and 2023. And the further you get or the closer you get to 2026, uh, probably the more muted that benefit's gonna be, that benefit of the, uh, the deferral period. And you know, then there's some other nuances with respect to trying to create interim liquidity uh, during the fund life, which we can talk about later. But we're still seeing some pretty decent fund flows. We expect them to continue through this year and perhaps next year. Uh, there's not a lot of clarity right now, not to jump ahead, as to whether or not the Extension Act is actually going to get subsumed into some other tax policy legislation to ultimately get passed. So we don't really know as we sit here today whether or not the Extension Act is going to be part, made part of the code. And to the extent that it is, I think it's just going to have that much more of a positive impact on our ability to continue to raise equity and deploy that equity into these qualified opportunity zones. You know, one other comment I want to make about the chart uh, that you didn't address from a regulatory perspective is in order to qualify for to be a qualified opportunity zone fund in the first instance, by census track data, the census track in particular had to manifest one or two characteristics. Either had to have a poverty rate greater than 20%, or prevailing median family income at or less than 80% of the prevailing metropolitan median family, metropolitan median family income. So the, the dynamics that, uh, that Sean went through in terms of the zones and the impact that they're having on these zones is really, that was all by design, just given the dynamics of how and, uh, and if a particular census tract is gonna be designated a qualified opportunity zone in the first instance. I know there was a lot of criticism, at least in, in Nebraska, there was a lot of criticism about the date from which the data that they used as well, given that it was based on the 2010 census. Uh, you know, there were a lot of areas that certainly had gentrified or changed between the 2010 census and, and you know, say, say 2017. So, uh, you know, using that data, I know, I know there was quite a bit of criticism when it first came out about where they, where they took that census track data from. So, yeah, good point, Kevin. Thanks. Yeah, and I would tell you that a lot of that census tract data is updated periodically in 2013 and 14, and then the census tracts themselves were designated, I think it was June of 2018, but it's a fair point. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Sean, same question for you. Talk to me about deal flow. When did you guys really kick off and, and how did things go in, in 2019, 20, and 21? Right. Yeah. So I'll echo a lot of what Kevin was saying as well. Uh, we launched our first fund in 2019. Uh, yeah. 2019, and we raised about 50 million. 
I hope numbers are okay. Um, I could use percentages if that's preferred, but oh, it was about 50 million on that fund in 2019. And then it's about a 60% increase in our fundraising in, in uh, 2020. And then uh, another 7% increase in 2021 from our prior year, year over year. So we've seen, we've seen a steady track uh, of increase in investment and deal flow. You know, I, who knows why that is? I have my guesses. My, my guesses are, yeah, it's, there's not one easy answer uh, for all of it. Part of it is the clarification of the regulations that Kevin was talking about. Part of it is the, uh, you know, trying to capture the 15% in 2019 or the 10% in 2021. I think a large part of it is also, uh, you know, CPAs becoming familiar with the program and reaching out to their clients and, and advising them that this is something they should be considering, which is something again, that I think uh, we have seen with uh, 1031 some many years ago. So uh, yeah, we're, we're anticipating uh, deal flow to continue uh, to escalate over time. I think 2026 for us, at least in our location, is gonna be uh, a big year. And I th the reason why it's a big year is, you know, assuming legislation doesn't change, assuming the extension doesn't occur. Well, there are some census tracts that, uh, to your point, Alan, you know, some people were complaining about based on, you know, a, a census data one of those being the zones that we operate in, in Silicon Valley, which is a completely different conversation and probably beyond the scope of this panel. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is it is an opportunity zone uh, here in San Jose, downtown San Jose. And I think folks, when they understand the benefits, you know, coming into 2026, and if there's any new iteration of the opportunity zone program, probably will not include San Jose again. So people might, uh, you know, we're guessing people are going to have a strong appetite to want to deploy some capital into that zone while they still have the opportunity. Yeah, good. Sounds good. Yeah. You know, I, I add one thing to that, which is once the qualified opportunity zone has received that designation, it doesn't change by virtue of the data that comes through the 2020 census. So that uh, designation really remains in place through the end of 2047. So uh, as much as some people may complain about some of the designations, they're not going to go away just by virtue of the fact they don't wouldn't otherwise qualify pursuant to the 2020 census tract data. Yeah, that's exactly right. Matter of fact, the IRS came out in an announcement 2021-10 and said exactly what Kevin just said. So that's actually more or less codified now from a regulatory perspective from the words of the IRS themselves. So we have some good confidence about those zone designations moving forward. Fair enough. Hey, Kevin, uh, you know, there was lots of discussion when OZs was first introduced regarding the differences between a typical 1031 exchange and an opportunity zone. I just wondered if you could spend a few minutes just kind of stepping through those differences. When we talked through the day, you had some, you know, kind of per personal thoughts about uh, OZs versus a 1031 and the, the benefits uh, of going into an OZ. Just kind of step us through some of the differences and your thoughts there, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think one of the principal differences uh, in order to affect a 1031 exchange, it's got to be real property, real property for real property. That's the like kind of exchange. So you're really limited to real estate. And, and, you know, as a real estate investor ourselves, if we're selling assets that are highly appreciated and generating a significant capital gain, our default is to think about a 1031 exchange. And I think that's probably pretty consistent uh, across the real estate investor spectrum. And you can see just looking at the securitized 1031 market, in 2021, it put up about $7 billion of equity. So it's seen some significant growth in its own right. Uh, the, the Qualified Opportunity Zone is a much broader platform from a, uh, from a capital gain perspective. You can really generate a capital gain from, from anything. You could sell your operating business, generate, get, generate a capital gain. You could sell collectibles. You could sell low basis, highly appreciated stock, which is what we did when we invested in our own Qualified Opportunity Zone fund and you really are only really deploying in, a, in an OZ fund the capital gain itself. In a 1031 exchange you've got to take if your goal is to avoid paying taxes or defer those taxes you've got to take the entirety of the disposition proceeds you can't exercise dominion over those proceeds they have to go right into a qualified intermediary you've got a series of rules that you've got to follow in terms of affecting ex the exchange you've got to identify your down -like property within 45 days you've got to close it within 180 days so the rules are uh, completely different than the OZ space. And as you indicated, Alan, to the extent that you generate a capital gain, again, from any source, and it could be long-term, it could be short-term capital gains, uh, you've got 180 days from the realization of that capital gain to reinvest it in a qualified opportunity zone. So uh, the rules kind of run in parallel, but the, the 1031 rules are really effectively only related to real property and doing a tax-free exchange in real property 
with its own set of uh, identification rules. Okay, fair enough. Um, Sean, talk to us about different asset classes. Uh, I know there's there, you had a slide earlier about the you know the different types of asset classes of real estate that we're invested in. You know, multifamily versus office. Um, I, I know your investment portfolio includes a lot of mixed use buildings. Can you give us your thoughts about what types of assets are best suited for this? Uh, you know, given accelerated depreciation and, and some of those other kind of considerations. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna echo something Kevin said earlier. It's something that, that I say all the time as well, which is the, the opportunity zone program is, shouldn't be viewed as a, as a tax deal primarily. It should be viewed, as, you should look at it, investors and advisors should look at it as a real estate deal first and foremost. So, you know, is there any particular deal suited to the opportunity zone program? Well, outside of a, a development deal, which is obviously something that the program is designed around, the asset class itself is going to have uh, the same factors uh, going into it that any other underwriting in a real estate deal would have. So you're going to look at, you know, location. You're going to look at, you know, data. You're going to look at community need. You're going to look at um, underwriting, and that's going to determine, in my opinion, anyway. That's going to you're going to determine first what's the best project asset class for that particular location, given all the factors that you're going to be considering, and then you know, the, uh, the opportunity zone program becomes like the icing on the cake. The, I will say this though, I do believe that there are certain structures from a tax perspective that are superior to others with respect to uh, taking advantage of the tax, uh, the tax benefits that the opportunity zone program offers. And that's, you know, again, another very long conversation that I can have and probably again, beyond the scope of this panel, but, you know, it's essentially at a very high level, the pass-through structure is, in my opinion, the right way to go. And, and the quasi pass-through and the non-pass-through vehicles are, you know, they're great for other types of product. For this particular type of product, I would argue that it's not ideal. Uh, Kevin, follow up from you on that. Is there any, any, any thoughts about, uh, you know, new development, raw land versus ground up versus a renovation of an existing building? Um, what kind of deals are you chasing or what kind of deals do you prefer to look at when it comes to opportunity zones? Yeah, so, I, you know, I kind of throw it in three different buckets. Uh, you know, there's the ground up development. There's the, uh, your ability to acquire an asset that's already been developed prior to getting a certificate of occupancy. So that could still qualify. The problem there or the, the lack of opportunity there uh, on a relative basis is you don't pick up the, the, the profit associated with actually doing the development itself. Now you're really buying a core stabilized asset and the substantial renovation, just to be clear there, my understanding is if you bought a property, for instance, for $2 million and you attribute a million dollars to the land, you have to add another million dollars to the basis to qualify. So for us to buy a piece of property that requires basically a hundred percent, you know, addition to the basis on the development itself, you might as well just scrape it and build it from scratch rather than engage in uh, in a substantial renovation like that, particularly for our asset class, which is multifamily. And the other thing that I want to be sure that we're clear about is you've got two real estate investors on the panel. There's a whole different world out there as it relates to operating businesses. And, and Sean had it on his slide as one of the asset classes, but there's a whole set of different rules associated with income attribution and whether or not you can start businesses in a qualified opportunity zone and have the disposition of that business achieve the same 100% fair market value basis step up uh, at the end of that 10 year period. So I, you know, there's, I've got friends in the private equity side of the business that have started business or are funded into businesses that have located or relocated into qualified opportunity zones to take advantage of this legislation as well. So even though I think the program as you had indicated is really dominated uh, by real estate and real estate uh, investment and development, there's, there is that other world out there of, uh, of operating businesses and starting operating business and qualified opportunity zones. I, I had suggested at one point when we started this down this business line that we moved the entire team into a qualified opportunity zone away from the beach in El Segundo, but I, I didn't get a lot of buy in there. Hey, Sean, how about you? I mean, thinking about the substantial improvement test and kind of staying on that theme, have oh. you have you experienced a, a development project yet in which you uh, you know purchased an existing project for a substantial amount and then had to uh, or for you know for an amount and then had to substantially improve that? Um, have you experienced that, or is it mostly ground up new development? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think uh, we have one uh, repositioning project in our in our fund one portfolio. 
that one is going to satisfy either test. It's going to it satisfies both the original use uh, that's being referred to because there was a 30 year, 36 month uh, vacancy prior to its acquisition by the fund. In addition to that, we'll also happen to satisfy the substantial improvement test. Now, for us, you know, in the in the in the land of Silicon Valley, it's it's a funny place uh, in a, in a lot of ways. One of the ways is in, in terms of uh, adjusted basis when you're taking the value of an asset at the times of purchase. If it's an aged asset, the value a lot of the times for us anyway is in the land, as opposed to the improvement. So, for example, if we bought a piece of land for uh, six million dollars and there's an, an improvement on it, maybe it's an old dilapidated. Uh, two-story uh, office over retail or something that's, uh, you know, barely used, the value might come in at, you know, a million dollars on the improvement and, you know, five, four, five million dollars on the land. And then, you know, with all of the pre-development and titling work, I mean, we oftentimes will hit the substantial improvement prong even before we get to construction. So, but to get to Kevin's point from a business perspective, it often does make the most business sense to just go ahead and scrape it and start from scratch. So yeah, we do have one renovation that's, uh, that's taking place, but it happens to benefit you know, because of the metrics involved in that particular deal um, from both uh, of the trade, uh, trade use requirements under, the, um, under subsection D. So yeah. Perfect. Um, just kind of lastly here, talk to us about census tracts, Kevin. Uh, you know, there's some sense in the real estate investment community that maybe, you know, all, all the good ones are gone or all the good tracks are, are controlled or they're, they're difficult to find. Uh, you know, as you talked about, uh, you know, your, your deal flow into your funds, both, both now and then as you kind of approach 2026, where are you finding, uh, are, are there, are there, I guess, are there still census tracks out there to invest in that make, that makes sense from a development perspective, or, or do you think they're all sold out? Well, you know, the, uh, the, the real estate market is a big market. The country is a big country. And the amount of land, I, I forget what the statistic is, but the percentage of the land that's covered by qualified opportunity zone designation is pretty significant. So, you know, we're in our third fund right now. We've got 21 assets in the first two funds. We're still seeing plenty of opportunity in terms of finding sites to develop. Um, you know, we just, uh, we, just, we just put one under contract uh, in this past week. So, but as we think about some of these markets like Phoenix or Tempe or Nashville or Austin, uh, you know, some of the markets in Florida like Tampa, uh, the Washington metro area, there's a lot of opportunities available to deploy capital and qualified opportunity zones. You know, when we were a participant in the GAO uh, report, and I will tell you that when they were trying to assess whether or not the legislation was having its, its you know, its intended impact. I, I think the thing that, that it was most um, significant from our perspective is had this qualified opportunity zone legislation not been, put, not been put in place in the first instance, we would not have raised fund capital around it. And again, we've raised a billion one to develop 2.3, 2.2 billion of multifamily assets. We wouldn't have started the fund and we wouldn't have invested in these communities, but for this legislation. So we were clearly on the side of the 12 as opposed to the side of the six. Okay, fair enough. Hey, Sean, you know, you're a little bit more geographically centered uh, or, or geographically, I guess, uh, you know, you're, you're not spread out all over the country. How about you from a from an opportunities perspective? Are you still seeing opportunities in this space or are they kind of winding to a close? Yeah, it's important to know that, you know, we were targeting this location even before the legislation. Had, we even were aware of it. Right, uh, we were going to do this anyway because we believe in the narrative here in downtown San Jose is, is you know part of the tech migration south, independent entirely from the tax benefits mm -hmm. from the Opportunity Zone program, and so we saw we had a pipeline and we still have a pipeline of well in excess of a of a couple billion dollars um, in deals here over the next anticipated ten or so years, and we're going to do that business regardless of whether or not there's an Opportunity Zone uh, that you know happens to be eligible for investment here. So. Yeah, we're folk. We're very you know, geographically focused. We have been our entire careers. Uh, we're not changing that um, business model that's worked very successfully for us in the past. And yeah, we see a lot of opportunity in business here, uh, you know, in the next decade or so. 
Uh, not necessarily to the tune of opportunity zones, but uh, you know, given inflation and what's happening in the inflationary markets, are, are any of your projects on hold, either Kevin or Sean, are any of your projects on hold? Are you reevaluating? Uh, do, do they still make sense given escalation of rents? What, what, you know, what, how is inflation impacting your development cycle for these OZ census tracts? Well, uh, in some sense, positively. I mean, we're not focused on a specific geographic area. We've got about 20 target markets that we look at in great detail. We're focused on a single asset class, which is multifamily. And the question for us is, can we continue to underwrite to 150 to 200 basis points spread to cost, untrended spread to cost? And if so, then these, these uh, multifamily developments continue to, uh, to pencil out. So there's an interesting dynamic uh, an interplay between inflation and uh, real rental rate growth. So we've seen a couple of dynamics play out over the last couple of years, which is, yeah, we've seen some, uh, some supply chain disruption. We've seen some increases in a lot of volatility in the cost of lumber and steel, uh, difficulty getting uh, you know, qualified workers on site, which is why we partner up with some of the best multifamily development part of developers in the country. So they've got a little bit more boots on the ground. They've got a little bit more influence in these local markets and we're continuing to underwrite. And, and the, the, um, the, the trade-off between inflation, uh, the backside of that is uh, inflation as opposed to rent. So we've seen some pretty significant rental rate growth, real rental rate growth over the last year or so. And we've also seen some cap rate compression. So we were able to maintain really that spread differential between uh, yield to cost and actually stabilize yield to uh, to continue to allow us to underwrite and invest in multifamily development. Sean, I guess same question. How about on the West Coast? What's happening from a from an inflationary standpoint, and are, are rents keeping pace with rising construction costs for the development? Yeah, we've seen uh, almost the exact same thing that Kevin had described. So, you know, business shut down here for about six months or so. Uh, I guess in a, in a meaningful way, anyway. And so it did delay some of our projects getting out of the ground by about that period of time. And yeah, inflation has had an impact on the underwriting in terms of construction costs going up a little bit, but still well within our uh, you know, reserve limits and our underwriting. So uh, we're not concerned about that at all. But something else interesting happened uh, that Kevin uh, already talked about, but you know, I'll give you a little bit of uh, more flesh to the bone on, on it from our perspective. You know, when we were doing our underwriting and our models, uh, even last year, uh, we had underwritten deals in, in, on the office side at four dollars and thirty-five cents square foot, and uh, now you know it, through all of this inflationary period and COVID and everything else, um, and since our underwriting occurred about six months or so ago, maybe it was eight months ago, rents are now at around five dollars and thirty cents a square foot. So that's of course we haven't updated our our modeling to take that into account, but uh, you know. In, in, all, in a lot of our past projects unrelated to uh, the opportunity zone space, a lot of our IRRs, you know, blew the roof off the place because, you know, they were in the, you know, in the 20s to the 40s. And people ask, how did that happen? You know, how, how it's not that we tried, you know, and designed it, not that we were geniuses and figuring out how to get to that kind of an IRR. It was a factor of rent growth. And so, you know, in that period of time of five years or whenever the, the, the life cycle was for that particular project, rents doubled literally 200% increase in rent. Uh, so it, it's things like that that we've seen happen here locally in Silicon Valley, why we're such belie big believers of the story here. And, it, it, and COVID and inflation has not seen, seemed to have any impact on that uh, to the negative at all. So it's uh, continuing as, as we've seen it continue uh, in the past. Yeah, and right. just, just, to be, just to be clear, uh, you know, Sean, you're showing your West Coast bias, which I appreciate. <laughs> that's you true. Say, when you say when you say five bucks a foot in rent, that's per month, and that, that's kind correct. of correct. That's unique to California. That's correct. that's correct. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that, Kevin. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I know the East Coast goes by per year. We go per month over here. Sounds good. Well, any any party shots, gents? Otherwise, we'll move over to uh, we'll move over to Q and A here. Yeah, you know, I'd like to add one thing about the uh, the 180 day period. So, in particular, if you're a financial advisor or investor on the call, I'm not sure what the profile is of those that have dialed in, but there's still opportunities to engage in uh, tax planning for 2021, even though you have to invest in a qualified opportunity zone fund within 180 days of the point of realization of the capital gain. There are some nuances there associated with pass through vehicles. So if you were an investor in a partnership or a limited liability company, which is the pass-through vehicle, 
and the LLC or the LP itself generated the capital gains and distributed those capital gains to the investor, then your 180 day period doesn't necessarily toll from the point at which you uh, realize that, that the passenger vehicle realized the, uh, the capital gain. You've got a couple other options. You could pick the last day of the taxable year for the passenger vehicle, which is generally December 31st, which would push your 180 days out through June. You also could elect to, to pick the tax filing date for the passenger vehicle, which is usually March 15th, which would push your 180 days out through September 11th. So you could have realized the capital gain, the partnership or the LLC at any point during 2021, and you still have until September 11th to redeploy those capital gains into a fund. So if you're a financial advisor and you've got visibility into your client's book, and you understand what it is they sold to generate that capital gain, there's still opportunities to redeploy capital gains realized in 2021. So I, I you know, want to be sure that uh, people are aware, well, we're aware of that nuance. Good clarification. Thank you. Sean, any parting shots? Yeah, I think when anybody's taking a look at an opportunity zone fund program, they need to think about two things uh, first and foremost. Number one is the real estate deal above all else, right? These are ultimately uh, real estate deals. First and foremost, the tax benefits being the icing on the cake. And then number two, uh, you know, deal specific projects aside, you know, there's, there's two ways that sponsors have approached this uh, program. And I think one is the right way and one is not the right way. It, one of the ways that they've done it is they've tried to figure out how to build the product for the structure. In other words, we have an opportunity zone program. So I'm, now I'm gonna figure out how to cobble together a product to, to, to squeeze into that box. The other way to do it is to, you know, build your product from the ground up and then figure out how to structure it ideally uh, with respect to the legislation that's in effect and the Opportunity Zone program. I think that's the right way to do it. So the two things to look at are the real estate deal, number one, and number two, how the program was structured. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would add to that that the uh, that underwriting the sponsor is every bit as critical as the real estate itself because there's a, there's a fairly rigorous compliance protocol you have to wrap around the qualified opportunities on legislation to make sure that you maintain compliance with the rules and regulations and not engage in a footfall, which also requires the sponsor to have an infrastructure in place that's there that's going to be there to service the investors for a 10 year period that's a fairly extensive uh, amount of back office work that needs to be done and needs to be done over an extended period of time so underwriting the sponsor and having visibility into what the sponsors infrastructure looks like so that they can both maintain compliance and maintain a reporting protocol to the investors is, is, is equally as important as the real estate itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move over to Q&A here for just a few minutes. Let's see what kind of questions we got coming in. Uh, got the Q &A. Alan, can you pull up the, the Q&A and go to the answered tab? Yep, I can, answered. And then you can okay. start with them. Yep, you bet. So uh, I'm just uh, reading off, reading on the cuff here. Current tax code says the capital gains rates will rise prior to the end of the deferral period. Have you done those calculations based upon the deferral to a higher tax rate? Uh, I guess I'm, I'm thinking probably Kevin that might go to your conversation about uh, whether that deferral. Uh, we, we talked about the five percent or the ten percent uh, basis step up. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about that deferral at a higher tax rate. Yeah, that's right. So and to, to be clear there, as I said earlier, you can invest either short-term or long-term capital gains, <clears throat> but the nature of that capital gains retains its character. So when you get to 2027, you're actually having to pay that tax bill, you're going to, and, and you roll the short-term capital gains, you're still going to be paying the short-term capital gains tax or ordinary income tax rate at the, at the ordinary income tax rate at the time. Similarly, in the, if you rolled over long-term capital gains, the long-term capital gains tax rate that's applicable to the tax that's going to be due in 2027 is the long-term capital gains tax rate in effect at that time. So one of the things you've got to balance is, you know, what your view is in terms of where you think long-term capital gains taxes rates are going to go between now and, and 2027 or at the end of 2026. <clears throat> so the, the 10 or 15% basis step up was a nice hedge uh, against uh, increases in long-term capital gains tax rates. You know, we've modeled it out for ourselves and, and, uh, and still believe that the 100% fair market value based stuff up after 10 years is going to overwhelm any potential increases in, uh, in long-term capital gains tax rates that are going to affect the tax liability in 2027. 
Okay, another question here from a tax perspective. Uh, is the 10 year exemption for the capital gains on the project based upon the date of acquisition by the fund or the date of investment by the client? Yeah, it's the latter. So I mean, we're a fund manager. So we've got, I don't know, 1700 investors in these two funds. So we've got to keep the fund outstanding for 10 years uh, past the, la the date of the last investor because we have, you know, we have 11 assets in, in, or 12 assets in one fund and nine in another fund. So because we, we, we've we used what's called a two-tier structure where the investors come in at the top level at the limited partnership, and then the limited partnership drops the equity down into a series of limited partnerships, which is our joint venture relationship with the developer. So you own kind of a radical piece, if you will, of each of the 12 or nine developments. And so you can't, sell any of them until such time as you 10 years have expired from the date of the last investor, which is why we've got serial funds and, and, uh, and they've got a finite life from a, from a, from an equity raise perspective. Okay. Uh, question here about capital gains. Do capital gains realized by revocable trust qualify like the LLC you mentioned for the longer time to invest those capital gains? Yeah, the short answer is yes. I mean, the okay. capital gains can be realized by any entity or any individual from any source. So, you know, and, and frankly, uh, uh, one of the investments I made was uh, capital gains realized by an asset I sold by my one of my revocable trusts. So, uh, yeah, same rules apply. Okay. And then the, the last one looks like a comment here that the more sponsors say they were going to invest in their deals, regardless of opportunity zone programs, the greater the possibility that the benefits will be reverse repealed. Hopefully this would only happen on the deals for the sponsors who made those statements. <laughs> Interesting perspective. Yeah, I, and I don't know, Sean, you probably have a perspective as a, as a litigator, but you know, once, yeah, well, uh, you know, once, the, once, the, uh, once the barn door has been open and the horses have left, it's a little difficult to put them back into the barn. So, you know, I, you know if, if the extension act goes through and if the administration wants to fiddle around around the edges as it relates to qualified opportunities on legislation once you've started to realize capital formation around a structure like this it's really difficult to reverse course so if there are any wholesale changes are going to be made to this legislation going forward i would expect it would be on a prospective basis and not on a retroactive basis yeah and more more to the point um i i have the the honor of being part of the working group, uh, which is a national group that works with the Department of Treasury, the IRS on the rollout of the regulations and their implementation. And the consensus is among that group. And they, they have the, the ears of, you know, the uh, co-sponsors, um, Cory Booker and Tim Scott, as well as their offices and staff, as well as um, not just the Senate, but also House of Representatives and the Congress and the White House. And the consensus is among among this group that the chances of uh, you know them scaling back the opportunity zone program is very very small. The the most likely outcome it would be adding some reporting requirements to it. Uh, the extension notwithstanding, you know if the extension doesn't happen, then the 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 most likely outcome would be to remove or not remove, but once. Uh, there's like a, there's a sunset. So December 31st, 2026, you can't invest into an opportunity zone program anymore. So then what would happen after that? And the, the thought have been, has been that, well, they would just either do one of two things. They'll create an entirely new body of legislation to do the same thing using different zones with some slightly different rules, or they'll just let it expire and it'll be done. And, and that's the two most likely outcomes. But for those folks that are investing, you know, in reliance on the regulations and the leg legislation as it exists today, chances of them taking that away is, is very, very small. So yeah, my comments about us doing it regardless of whether or not the, the tax law exists has nothing to do and is not a comment at all as to whether or not I think the tax law is gonna be re repealed. I do not think that's the case. I think that the, my main point, the reason I made that comment is because I think the deal is what matters most. And that's exactly how we approached it. And then we found out that we were located in an opportunity zone and could convey some pretty nice tax benefits on top. So, yeah, I, I think the important thing too is, you know, Booker and Scott are still very strong proponents. And yeah. I, I don't say this often, 
as it relates to either the last administration or this administration, but this is still tax policy that's got strong support from both sides of the aisle. That's correct. Matter of fact, there's, they're fighting over who gets to take credit for it now, you know, with the GAO coming out with some pretty good statistics. So, yeah, I don't think anybody wants to get rid of this thing. Sounds good. So does the, does the working party group have a view in terms of the prospects of the extension and getting passed? Yeah, they, uh, right now, the view of the working group is that there's so much dysfunction, I guess, maybe that's my word, not theirs, uh, that's going on in Congress right now that getting anything done seems to be a challenge with all the other obstacles presented in their path currently right now. But there was a committee hearing that occurred recently that was chaired by a sitting Democrat at the time and whose name is escaping me right now. But uh, he indicated in the initial comments publicly on the record that nobody across both chambers had any intent on doing anything other than protecting and preserving the program. So that literally came out of the words of you know, uh, um, the congressman himself. So I think that's a pretty good indication that they're trying to figure out how to make this thing uh, last a long time. Okay. Well, I, I think I think redundant and uh, dysfunctional in the same sentence as relates to or, or uh, Congress and dysfunctional is is redundant. <laughs> Agreed. Fair enough. Okay. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of our Q and A. There, Brooke, do you want to help wrap us up here? Absolutely. Thank you all very much for participating today, and we appreciate all of our registrants and attendees. Um, in closing, just a reminder that all materials featured and presented will be available in 12 to 24 hours at realassetsadvisor.com and adisa.org. Again, upcoming is our March 9th webinar. Stay tuned. Thank you again. This concludes our webinar. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you very much.